Welcome to Your Cases on Hold, a JBJS podcast hosted by Antonia Chen and Andrew Schoenfeld. Here, we discuss the science of each issue of JBJS with an additional dose of entertainment and pop culture. Take us with you in the gym, on the commute, or most certainly, whenever your case is on hold. Welcome back to Your Case is on Hold. We are discussing the February 8th issue of the journal Bone and Joint Surgery, as well as the latest and greatest in pop culture, entertainment, fashion. Um, welcome back to our repeat listeners, and welcome to those who may be tuning in for the first time to hear about what great science is present in the February 8th issue of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, for our listeners, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Um, make sure that uh, you get notifications for uh, every issue of Your Cases on Hold that drops and uh, do look for us give us a rating if you can on spotify apple stitcher uh the jvjs.org website or any other places where you find your podcasts um once again as a disclaimer uh what we're covering here are the opinions of myself and antonia uh they don't reflect the policies of the editorial board the board of trustees or the editors of the various JBJS family of journals. Uh, we are brought to you today by the Miller Review Course. Uh, it's that time of year again. And for those who are thinking about uh, step one ABOS testing, or those who are recertifying um, using one of the testing uh, options, or for those who just want to stay up to date, uh, it's great for everyone and um do sign up uh i think that the uh, rates uh, are now standard so um there's still time and uh still opportunities for you to register for this very great meeting uh by way of introduction allow myself to introduce myself i'm richie cunningham and my colleague is oprah uh, in actuality, I'm Andrew Schoenfeld, Deputy Editor for Methods at the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and the Van Helsing Professor of Occult Science at the University of Transylvania. And I am Oprah. You get a podcast, you get a podcast, you get a podcast. There's so many podcasts in 2023, so you can enjoy all the breadth of it and you have a full year from 2022 that you can go back and look at the wonderful gems of knowledge. So. You get it all. On my alter ego, I am Antonia Chen. I am a hip and knee surgeon, and I am deputy editor of Adobe Construction. Thank you very much for being here. And we say, I, generally, we save the plugs to the end, but I don't want to forget about this one. The AOS meeting is coming up, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Both Antonia and I will be there. That's super rare that we're in the same place at the same time. We will be at some point at the JVJS booth, so definitely stop down there frequently and repeatedly. Um, catch up with us, come see us. Come and get some free coffee us. at the same time. Um, free coffee, I guess. Um, that's always good and welcome. Uh, definitely. Uh, and if you get the um, the invitation uh, as your reviewer to attend the, uh, the reviewer's um, uh, cocktail reception, definitely do that as well because we'll also be there. Maybe we'll even record um, a uh, Your Cases on Hold episode from the meeting. Who knows? Uh, with that, we'll go into the top of the pile. Um, a framework and blueprint for building capacity in global orthopedic surgical outreach. Really important outlook on global orthopedics by Shapiro. The doctor of osteopathic medicine, the affiliation to orthopedic surgery, kind of like a historical touch point, the intersections between orthopedics and um, osteopathic medicine by Sachs. What's important? I want privilege too by Porter. This is permanently free. And then the role of dual mobility components in total hip arthroplasty by Manson and colleagues. With that, we'll move into the headlines. 
Uh, my headline is Neurological Survivorship Following Surgery for Degenerative Cervical Myelopathy, a Longitudinal Study on 195 Patients by Yick and colleagues, and there is a commentary. Uh, I thought this was a very interesting study. That's why I selected it as, as a headline. Uh, I thought there were a lot of uh, interesting features uh, about it. Um, and also a couple of points that I think are useful for the audience. Some some tips will follow. So uh, get your ears on for uh, researchers and those um, looking for best practices in terms of composing papers, conducting your research. Of course, um, from a clinical standpoint, degenerative cervical myelopathy is a very common spinal condition, one I see quite regularly in, in, in my practice and, and most who are working in the spine space do. Um, it's a condition that we know uh, is progressively uh, deteriorating with time and can result in significant uh, and substantial neurologic impairment for those who uh, are suffering from it. Uh, surgery is generally considered the conservative treatment. It's one of the few times where uh, in you know what is essentially elective procedures, surgery is kind of you're offering that even without talking about other non-operative measures because uh, what we're really talking about is canal restriction and compression of the spinal cord for which effective decompression is really the only way to arrest further deterioration and in some respects, you know, regain uh, what may have been lost, although that isn't always an uh, achievable point of fact. Um, but then there are also concerns about the long-term consequences and neurologic survivorship after the index procedure. And this is something that these individuals were looking at. And so they ended up uh, collecting 195 patients who underwent surgical intervention for myelopathy over a, two a period of two decades, 1999 to 2020. They were essentially looking at neurologic survivorship uh, for the period of time in which they were following these patients. And of course, um, there's highly variable uh, time frames and time windows in which these these patients are are being followed. Uh, it essentially goes from like a minimum of one year to 261 months or so, or something like that. Quite a, quite a wide range uh, uh, of follow up. And uh, overall, they're estimating neurologic survivorship at close to 90 percent at five years and 77% at 10 years. They then conduct a multivariable Cox uh, hazard regression to look at what, what they present as risk factors uh, for the neurologic failure. And then here's where things get dicey. They develop a nomogram. Um, so let, let, let's take it from the top here. The first thing is it's 195 patients collected over 20 years. That's about less than 10 patients a year, really. Um, so, so not especially you know, high volume for the cohort that they were able to assemble. They report the mean period of observation as 76 months. So... Um, you know, somewhere in like the six, seven year range, uh, which is which is pretty good, but certainly uh, not for the ten year follow up, and that's also the mean. So in these situations, a best practice is actually to report the median because that's what gives you a better sense of kind of um, where the the real average is, where the the large majority of patients are following up, if you give a median and an interquartile range, because if you just present the mean, you can be misled, and it, it's oftentimes sees it uh, better it seems better than it is because you're you know one patient who's been followed for two hundred and sixty months or something like that can offset a lot of patients with with much lower levels of follow up. So. Um, when they the some of the things that they defined as risk factors are also a little bit problematic as far as I'm concerned. So the 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 results of the analysis, they found suture laminoplasty was a risk factor, a very a very uh, high hazard, uh, approaching four point eight renal failure, T two hyperintensity, and then ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. 
Now the, you know, what if you don't, what if, what if, it, if your practice, you don't do suture laminoplasty and, and in addition, suture laminoplasty, I think is an, is an older technique really that if people who are doing laminoplasty now, they, they may, um, use the, the small plates that allow for instrumentation and there are different ways to do laminoplasty procedures. So some of this that they start to find when they have their results. It may be a little bit parochial. Anything that you're factoring in the model is going to influence the estimates for the other factors. And then we get to the nomogram. And when I saw that they did a nomogram, you know the comedian Nigel Eng? Um, yeah. He has a character, Uncle Roger, who hates Jamie Oliver. And he does like these YouTube shorts watching Jamie Oliver cook. <laughs> that's gotta be fun <laughs> <laughs> and and i i i just i i i flashed on that because he'll be like jamie oliver is making um you know red thai curry and he's only using one red chili or he's using uh red chili jam and and nigel eng's character will be like no what are you doing don't don't uh, so they keep they're like and then we did a nomogram and I was just like no not a nomogram no come on this is with an accent too you've got to do it with an accent no, to keep back none, none of that none of that <laughs> anyhow if you don't know who Nigel Eng is check out his comedy it actually is quite good and uh, you'll you look up Uncle Roger Jamie Oliver and and you'll get some stuff and you'll you'll see where I'm coming from. But uh, it is just like, no, don't do the nomogram. No, oh, no, it's so simple. You just do simple stuff, okay? You do it right the first time, okay? Um, and mainly because, like, I don't see how this nomogram is going to really factor into um, estimates for, for other centers. That's, that's the biggest issue. The, or, or really the biggest issue is we don't need more nomograms about very small um specific topics but the bigger picture is i think there's there's big concern here for restricted clinical variation and truncation and and that these findings may be very specific to the surgical practice in addition they have um 20 years of data that's collected they didn't account for secular trends that's another best practice that was kind of missed here and that's somewhat of a methodologic misstep uh, in addition, their estimates for the 10-year follow-up are going to have wide confidence intervals just because of the nature of the data as I drilled down for you, and, and they don't disclose that. So, you know, the the good parts about this, and certainly why it's being presented here, is that, you know, you, even in, in a best-case scenario for a retrospective work, you don't have these multiple repetitive touch points for patients to assess the overall neurologic survivorship. There may also be a surveillance bias here too, um, which is a counterpoint to that initial statement. So some of the estimates, you know, eighty nine point three percent. That's probably pretty high, um, and 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 fairly valid with the study design and the follow up that they have. I could see that showing up as a testable item at some point on an OITE or or an ABOS uh, something or other. So uh, you know, keep your eyes on that. And I think that's that's really the the beginning and the end for this. The the nomogram, um, it's Dr. Romo from anesthesia, and and it's not he's not sure if your case can go. He's like it, it's it's canceled essentially. The uh, wah wah wah. That's how I feel about my cases right now. <laughs> Harkening back to the. Um, to our comments from the January for the, the first January episode, uh, they had to do a prior authorization and it was, it was not, it was not approved. All right. Ouch. Not approved. <laughs> prior authorization insurance companies take that. Oh, no, we lose. So no nomograms for you. All right. Um, that's what I have. Tell me about your headline. My headline's on comparison of functional recovery between unit compartmental and total knee arthroplasty, a randomized controlled trial by Pongtran et al. They also have a visual summary and it's free the 30 days. So come check it out. They're from our Thai colleagues from across the world and they've done a nice randomized controlled trial between unit compartmental and total knee arthroplasty patients. Uh, and they make up a good point where they say these type of patients, the problem is most of our studies are focused on PROMs. 
And while that's a step up from the past when our studies used to be, well, looks good, and that was the outcome, or never revised, and that was the only outcome, patient-reported outcomes actually took what the patient said and brought that to fruition. And now they're taking it a step further and looked at functional outcomes after unit compartmental knee arthroplasty and total knee arthroplasty. So the idea is that it's a f- beneficial to aesthetics and PROMs can overestimate outcomes and maybe not be as meaningful to patients. So they did a prospective randomized control trial trial in only patients who had medial isolated osteoarthritis. And they did a mobile bearing unicompartmental arthropl- knee arthroplasty or a fixed bearing posterior stabilized total knee arthroplasty with unresurfaced patella. So they did a power analysis. They based it on their pilot data from the first six weeks and found that they needed 46 patients per group. So they did enroll more than that in each group, which is good. Um, It is based on their own data. So their own pilot data is what fed the uh, power analysis. Um, It might have been interesting to see that from literature because there have been other studies comparing unit compartmental arthroplasty to total knee arthroplasty. In their inclusion criteria, they said only inclusion of patients age 50 to 85 uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know why patients under 50 were excluded. Uh, we do have patients who do undergo total knee arthroplasty or unicompartmental knee arthroplasty in younger patients. Uh, not as common, but it does happen for sure. Um, they did have an exclusion criteria of the need for surgery on the contralateral side. Um, I don't know if that meant simultaneously. So if they meant if they had underwent bilateral surgery, that they would be excluded, or if it was just you know, uh, if they had to un- go surgery on the contralateral side at any point in time or prior to surgery. So that wasn't well defined. Um, and another thing that said contraindications to either procedure, both total knee and unique compartment in the arthroplasty, were a remote source of infection. So a remote source of infection is pretty wide. You know, if you had septic arthritis as a kid when you were 10 and you're undergoing a knee replacement at the age of 60, um, that's a long time frame. So I wonder if it was just because if the patient was infected, they'd have to get a total knee arthroplasty and they couldn't be a candidate for a partial knee arthroplasty. Um, when it comes to the implants, you know, I, I mentioned earlier one was a mobile bearing, one was a fixed bearing. It might have been more interesting potentially for sake of uh, apples to uh, slightly more apples to apples as compared to fixed bearing to fixed bearing or mobile bearing to mobile bearing implants with regards to unit compartmental knee arthroplasty versus total knee arthroplasty. Um, and then another thing too is they chose a PS implant. Um, and in the ACL, sorry, in the unit compartmental knee arthroplasty, of course, the ACL and the PCL are both conserved. Um, so if you can preserve the PCL in uh, CR, that might be a, a more similar comparison. But that said, they did a lot of PROMs. They looked at Knee Society score, Oxford Knee score, Forgotten Joint score, uh, CUS and the Kujala score, which if you remember from last time, we talked about patellofemoral um, as a score there. And we don't commonly use that in knee arthroplasty, but you can imagine that the patellofemoral joint was something of interest here. I do like the fact that the study had two-year follow-up. Uh, we'd like to do that for implant studies, so it did have a minimum of two-year follow-up for all patients. Um, and the take-home message, which probably wasn't a huge surprise based on other studies and literature, that there was early recovery up to three and six months, but no real difference long-term at one, two years in really any of the metrics. And that's including the two-minute walk test, so it's the amount of distance that you can walk maximum in two minutes, and versus the uh, tie up and go. So you sit up, stand up, walk three meters, and then come back down. So at one or two years in the long run, it doesn't make a huge difference. But most studies have shown that the unique compartmental knee arthroplasties do have, quote, faster recovery in the early postoperative period. And the nice thing about it is they quantify the distances walked over two minutes. Uh, and the differences are statistically significant and I would argue also clinically significant. So unicompartmental knee arthroplasty patients could walk 96 meters versus 81 meters in two minutes. That is a pretty good difference. Um, the difference persisted at three months um, and at six months. Uh, but however, with the one and two years were pretty similar. Um, it's one of those interesting things that the findings did find that the um, two uh, the two minute walk test and the tug test were significantly better than the preoperative means at all time points. But for total knee arthroplasty patients, the mean time up and go at six weeks was not better than their preoperative time point. So interestingly enough, um, that was the time frame that they were actually still not in great shape in comparison to the preoperative. So the preoperative was better than they were tying up and go at six weeks. And part of that is that the quadriceps is still getting better and stronger after surgery, and um, they're still undergoing um, exercises to try to improve their ADLs. Uh, my real question to these tests, the two-minute walk test and 
the tied up and go is like, how much do they correlate to activity of daily living that patients are interested in, right? So patients will come in my clinic and say, I want to play pickleball. You know, does the two minute walk test correlate to pickleball or the tied up and go test? Um, and those are the things that there are other studies have looked at different correlations. Um, but that's the question that my patients want to know. And if I do a uni compartment of I can walk a longer distance for two minutes. But what if I want to wait a sustained walk for two hours? Uh, what if I want to walk a longer distance? So the, the tied up and go test, though, is pretty useful. I would say it's very beneficial because it looks at balance and it has been connected with fragility and other things like that. So those are things that we obviously want in the early time frame, especially for patients to be stronger and better at. So there is understanding that other factors can affect these functional outcomes, right? We just talked about a spine case, right? Two minute timed up and walk test and timed up and go test can be affected by lumbar spine radiculopathy. You know, there's other things that can affect these areas too. So it might be nice to be able to normalize these values. We did see improvement in patients, but it would be nice to normalize these patients at their baseline, to try to account for some of these variables. But overall, I think this is a, a decently done study. You know, I, and um, I think it adds to the body of literature. It's not necessarily novel, but it does add to the body of literature that if a patient has isolated medial compartment, unit compartment to autoplasty, um, they could be a candidate for a partial knee replacement in the medial compartment and potentially a better function in the post-operative period. For the timed up and go, you said sit up, stand up, but you forgot, come on, throw your hands up. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> House of pain, jump around. House of pain from Boston. Jump around, played at every University of Wisconsin football game in the third quarter. Fun fact, uh, the House of Pain video for Jump Around includes uh, friends I went to junior high school with from my neighborhood who went to the St. Patrick Day parade on which they were filming um, that video or events associated with that video. We'll so now I, after this, I'm going to go watch that video for sure. <laughs> I'm not in it. It's not me, but uh, it's it's a lot of people I know. It's right. coolness by association. That's right. And you can't get cooler than Everlast from House of Pain. Incidentally, also tying it back in, um, you know, pretty slim guy, pretty fit guy. He's a boxer. He reminds me of Conor McGregor. Like he was like Conor McGregor is the Everlast of our time 30 years later. That that song is 30 years old. I mean, if you can believe it. Is it really? Oh gosh, don't beat us now. Come on, Andrew, you're dating us. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, when, when, when I was in training, which was the only time I was doing joints, but when I was in training, for someone to get a UKA, they basically had to look like Everlast. Like you had to be super slim, like, you know, really fit, like uh, high muscle mass to body fat ratios. Um, and maybe, you know, some things have changed, but certainly that's one thing that came to mind, particularly in regards to this was work that was done in Thailand. Nothing to go on hold here, of course. I mean, they checked all the high points, as you said, plus they have the coups and the forgotten joint score, which is my favorite. So, hey, Thomasat University, have us out. We won't put your case on hold. But um, the translational capacity for this, I think, is, you know, also open to, to question. Does does this work for the patient with isolated medial knee OA in Minnesota or in Texas or in other parts of the United States where, where BMI may be higher and, and um, physiologic burden may be higher? That's always a tough one. I would say the original Scott and Cozen criteria for unipart compartment arthroplasty coming from Boston uh, used to be a patient had to be over the age of 70 um, couldn't have any sort of flexion contraction, only had a certain various deformity. You know, I think our indications have changed with time. So, but it's a good question. Can this be translated across all of our patients? And um, the answer is we don't know. So that is something I would say we can challenge them by bringing that study over here or we'll send them patients of ours and have them undergo surgery in the sunny area of Thailand. Yeah, it'll be, um, what is that? Medical tourism. There you yes, destination surgery. Like I'm not, you're not really the right patient for me, but I want you to go see my colleagues in Bangkok. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'll, I'm happy to go too. <laughs> All right, moving into your case on hold, the featurette. Ding, ding, ding. Here we go. Let's get ready to rumble. Surgical treatment of single level lumbar stenosis is associated with lower two year mortality and total cost compared with non-surgical treatment. 
a risk-adjusted paired analysis by Huang and colleagues. There is an infographic and also a commentary so you don't have to buy what I'm selling. You can see what someone else wants to sell you on this work. Um, this work we selected for the Your Cases on Hold featurette because I think there are some aspects that can be considered controversial here. Um, this is a study about single level surgery for lumbar stenosis with or without spondylolisthesis. So it's somewhat of a heterogeneous cohort because those are different clinical entities to some degree. Um, and they compared operative to non-operative treatment. And then within the operative treatment, they're looking at laminectomy, fusion, and then laminectomy and fusion. And certainly for stenosis, alone, laminectomy alone would be kind of the gold standard mainstay. For spondylolisthesis with stenosis, laminectomy and fusion would be the gold standard mainstay, uh, certainly as far as practices go here in the United States. And then fusion alone is probably really the question mark for, for both um, clinical conditions, certainly in the Medicare population. Um, but, you know, factored into here, uh, they're looking at patient mortality, resource utilization, healthcare payments over the first two years. And this was done using Medicare fee for service data. They call it the Medicare National Database, but uh, that there's no such thing as the Me Medicare National Database. So I, I think it's fee for service files, as they say, between 2011 and 2017. And the first thing that comes into play when you're comparing operative and non-operative management is questions around selection bias. Those individuals who are, are not um, medically robust, if they're frail, if they're at high risk for mortality on the operating table or in the post-operative period, maybe they don't get offered surgery. So the way that they are trying to address this concern is with a risk stratification index, which they maintain has a two-year prediction of mortality risk and was used as a measure of baseline patient health. So they're going to uh, match patients by RSI and demographics, and they were able to find matches for about 88% of the cohort. Um, and then they're looking at mortality, healthcare utilization, and essentially Medicare payments. Now, the, the Medicare payments, at least as far as on the operative side go, you'd expect laminectomy alone just off the bat without looking anything forward to be less expensive because once you're using implants, there's more expense associated with that, often longer hospital stays, often higher risk of complications need for future surgeries. But not every surgery can just be treated laminectomy. And if you use a laminectomy on the wrong surgical procedure, say they have a spondylolisthesis with instability or something along those lines, then you can just drive the patients toward needing more surgery on that side. So they have a lot of patients, uh, 62,000 uh, individuals um, with stenosis alone, and then um, over 80,000 with stenosis and spondylolisthesis. So surgical intervention of any kind was associated with 28% lower two-year mortality compared with matched patients undergoing non-surgical treatment. Uh, total Medicare payments were significantly lower for patients with stenosis alone undergoing laminectomy alone. So they got the what would be considered the gold standard uh, procedure. And to patients with stenosis and spondylolisthesis undergoing laminectomy with or without fusion as compared to the non-surgical cohort. And then again, no surprise here, laminectomy alone was associated with significantly lower two-year payments when treating stenosis with or without spondylolisthesis. It's a less expensive surgery, a uh, significantly less expensive surgery. I mean, drastic differences uh, with a lower complication profile. So it, if it's the indicated procedure and a successful procedure, you would expect that that would play out. Their conclusions... And here's where we start to, you know, get into the, uh, again, we'll, we'll do a, a, a literary quote, the Scylla and Charybdis, Arts and Humanities. It's not just for the frontispiece of the journal. It's not just for the top of the pile. It's for us right here in the Your Cases on Hold featurette. Um, surgical treatment for stenosis with or without spondylolisthesis 
within the Medicare population was associated with significantly lower mortality and total payments compared with non-surgical management. And then they have this really excellent caveat, although residual founding could have contributed to these findings. Um, truer words have not been spoken. I think I'm going to say that all the time. I'm yeah. just going to say that residual founders for everything in life. <laughs> right. You had an excellent surgical outcome, although residual found confounding could have contributed to this. Officer, I know you think I was speeding, but residual confounders could have contributed to this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of problematic aspects here. Um, and one other thing is, is at times that they're, they're fast and loose with, with some of their terminologies. And this may be semantics, but they say in their methods, we prospectively applied the risk, uh, the risk score. Um, and I get what they're saying, which is like they applied the risk score before they did anything else. But that's not really, when you use the term prospective, that is a word that has like real meaning. And prospective things mean they actually happen in, in a science realm that happens before you ask like the study question. So this is retrospective data. It's claims-based data. However you want to characterize it, using the term prospective in this, it just doesn't really fit. And then it, it gets you know the antennae up for for all the other things. So probably if you're doing retrospective work, don't use the word prospective. Don't say prospectively uh, collected data because you know at the end of the day all data is collected prospectively. Definitely do not use the word ambispective. Don't don't. That's a non-starter. So there's another free tip that just you know as a sidebar here. No ambispective research design. That's not a research design. It's it, it's just going to raise the flags of reviewers and editors that it's like, whoa, hold up. You know, um, there, there are definitely some issues here. So uh, the, the biggest points that really, for me, you know, stand out to the negative for this is that they're, they're, when they say residual confounding could have contributed to these findings, there is a major concern for residual confounding. Because they're using non-granular clinical data to develop these risk stratification profiles. And, and it's patient history profiles is what they say. And patient history profiles are only as good as the patient history that's being collected through what's billed to Medicare or what's coded for Medicare. And you know, if it's someone who had absolutely really very limited access to care or little interest in accessing care... And then they show up, maybe they look on paper a lot healthier than they are from a patient history profile standpoint. Then there are also surgical decision factors. If a patient has diabetes, what's the level of control for, especially encoding between 2011 and 2017? A lot of this is, you know, in the pre ICD 10 period. And, and even then, you're, you're really only. You're beholden to how good the the actual clinicians are, how invested they are, and really accurately coding these things. If a patient has diabetes, they have diabetes. Well, how well is it controlled? What was their last hemoglobin A1C? All these things are factors that a surgeon is going to use to decide: yes, you can have surgery; no, you, no, you shouldn't right now, or no, you can't going forward. Uh, in addition, this is spinal stenosis. You hear spinal stenosis, maybe your mind goes to neurogenic claudication. But that's not necessarily the clinical condition that all these patients were suffering from. And that makes sense. Like if a patient can't walk because they have neurogenic claudication from severe spinal stenosis, and then they have a surgery and they can walk more and they can exercise better, that's going to contribute to survival. Um, but not all of these patients inherently will have neurogenic claudication. And even then, there are varying degrees of neurogenic claudication. So to say that in any Medicare patient, which does seem to be the case that they're making, uh, if they have spinal stenosis, they should have surgery, and this is going to result in lower payments and uh, or, or lower healthcare utilization and improved mortality um, over a two-year time frame. I think there's a lot of tangential stuff in it, and if the authors have to say residual confounding could have contributed to these findings, then you know residual confounding has contributed to these findings. If it's listed, it is there. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I it's all it's. Medicare data, it's it's large. I think if you're looking to find things to support your decision to do surgery, you can definitely use this. I think it's more of a lamppost to lean on 
than any kind of illumination to go back to that age old analogy that appeared in episode one, first appearance, episode one. I love it. I can't add more to that. I mean, as a surgeon, you're always like, well, this is nice if this supports surgery, but everything has to be taken with a grain of salt here. There's just too many confounding variables that make this a take home message. So it's a good thought, but I'm with you. All right, moving into the honorable mentions. No benefit of adductor canal block compared with anterior local infiltration analgesia in primary total knee arthroplasty, a single blinded randomized controlled clinical trial by Pick and colleagues, also with a commentary. So check that out. Orthostatic intolerance type events following hip and knee arthroplasty, a systematic review and meta analysis by DeCampos and colleagues. Primary closure or secondary wound healing of pin sites after external fixator removal, a single center blinded randomized controlled trial, Tillman and colleagues, 30 days. 30 days free. This this is 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 a well done uh, work and definitely worth worth checking out. Um, we don't have time to cover uh, every uh, article, of course. This was one that we really heavily considered to feature here um, and, and in RCT. So those are always um, worth uh, looking in on. High potential for test questions, I think. Comparison of human quote unquote and artificial intelligence hand and wrist skeletal age estimation in an epiphysiodesis cohort by Cluck and colleagues, and then early joint use following elbow dislocation limits range of motion loss and tissue pathology in post-traumatic joint contracture by Ryder and colleagues. That wraps it up for this episode of Your Cases on Hold and the February 8th issue of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, we're about out of time. Um, we'll try to do better next time. Of course, your case is still on hold and will be on hold through the March American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Conference. Come out there, come see us, come check out what new things we have to offer uh, now and in the future and go back and listen to some of those older episodes for the Easter eggs and all the other good science that's baked in. Looking forward to seeing you guys. And my case is actually on hold right now. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Time should go by the time we were done here. I hope so. We'll see. All right. Thanks, everyone.